so I'm presenting on um, Australian intended parents' experiences of commercial surrogacy in India. And I guess it couples a little bit with what I was talking about yesterday with surrogate, surrogate experiences. So this is um, only based on the couples that I've spoken to, of course, and um, it's not, it, yeah, so it's um, a small scale. Um, I was going to start out with some interesting facts about, um, about surrogacy, but I don't know if they're any interesting to me. Um, I guess they're things that you can just say to friends. Um, <laughs> At the bar, or at the bar. Yeah, friends over for dinner, and you're talking about surrogacy. You can say, "Hey, um, did you know it's been around since Genesis?" Um, but I don't know how relevant it is really to the paper. So I wrote a bit about it, and then looked at it and thought, "You probably don't want to hear all that." So I'll just go through it point by, by point by point instead. So um, evidence of surrogacy is in uh, the Aramaic um, writings, so Genesis. Um, uh, traditional surrogacy, so we had Sarah and Abraham and um, there was another couple as well. Um, uh, the term surrogate mother came about in the 1950s with some um, Harry Harlow's experiments on uh, macaques where he was studying um, basically mother-child bonding, so that's where the term comes from. It's changed now in its meaning because back then it meant uh, that the person who did the care work was the surrogate mother and now uh, when the child was external to her, but now it's uh, the, the woman doing the care work internally. So that's changed. Um, but in each case, it was a bit, yeah, it's okay. I think I'm just gonna skip to the bit where I'm talking about you all. That might be better. Because that is being covered by everybody else. And I don't think it's necessary. What I'm talking about. I spoke to somebody at the um, Australian Consulate in Delhi and he told me that 30 Australian babies were registered in the Australian Consulate in Delhi per month, which is interesting compared to uh, the statistics Sam was showing. Um, yeah, that can't be, yeah, that's an interesting, I don't know how, uh, how valid that is, but I thought it was pretty interesting. So I asked couples to tell me about their surrogacy journey and I kept the question open-ended intentionally because I did not want to frame the way that couples spoke about their experience. I recorded many hours of these stories from this material and I'm just presenting a small amount from this material um, just based on some of the most common themes. Well, the, yep. So the first theme is um, altruistic surrogacy and adoption. All the couples I spoke with began the story of their surrogacy journey with the reasons why they didn't vote for any of the alternatives available in Australia. One of the couples I spoke with had been through um, the fostering course offered in Sydney with the intention of fostering and with the hope of eventually adopting a child. They found that the foster program in New South Wales entailed many visits from government officials, open-ended open visitation uh, with the genetic parents and was basically a co-parenting arrangement um, and they felt that that didn't really offer a stable environment for a child. Um, so I'm quoting, I think if we were going to go for it, having children, um, we had to only do uh, surrogacy as our only option because we wanted children and we couldn't share with anyone. The fact is that visitation rights for, of fostering was like once a month and they um, have a say in the level of parenting that you do. So that was my major problem. And we've got other people documenting how the kids would be raised, and I had troubles with that. So another couple of, um, applied for and was, were accepted into the Permanent Care and Adoption Program in Victoria. After nearly five year, years of anticipation and hope and the intermittent, intermittent reassurance from the program representatives, they still had not been placed with a child. And I'm quoting again. In one way you think it's, it's good, so maybe those children are being looked after and there's no need for, for that, meaning no need for adoption. But I think in reality, a lot of the children are stuck in the foster care system or they go after kinship orders rather than permanent care now. So I think that's why we weren't placed. Permanent care and fostering laws in Australia are not always the ideal path to parenting. Kinship orders and known adoptions are the preferred form of adoption in Australia. In fertile couples, wanting to adopt within Australia face hard statistics. In 2008-2009, of the 441 children adopted, 
out in Australia, only 14% were local adoptions, so that means only 14% of them weren't overseas. Um, that means approximately 2% per state. 61% were inter-country adoptions and 24% were known adoptions, so within the child's existing kinship group or family. That's according to the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. The chances of local um, or inter-country adoption in Australia were statistically low and the foster care system allows uncertain, um, involves uncertainty and the prospect of co-parenting with both um, the state and the child's genetic um, kin, which is not as considered to be a stable environment for a child by parents. Both options were impossible for the families I spoke with. Altruistic surrogacy was equally difficult because the laws in Australia maintain that the birth mother of the child born through surrogacy has the right to keep the child postpartum. This presents an equally uncertain route into parenthood. One couple described a friend's generous act to, to off, uh, offer to act as a surrogate. Uh, so I'm speaking to a couple here and one of the, the people says, um, do you remember our lovely friend Ramona offered to carry our child for us? And we said no, that we couldn't accept that because, and the pa his partner continues, yeah, that wasn't good for me because, you know, Ramona, an Australian woman, had the choice that if she wanted to hang on to the baby or to raise the baby, it's fine, I know her and everything like that, but I still don't want to share or co-parent in any way, shape or form. It's hard enough raising a child without someone else outside of your home life saying, oh, this is how it's done, or... And then the partner responds. She said, "Look, I don't want to raise the child, but it might have changed. She might have changed her mind, or it might have mucked up our friendship. It might have made it awkward, and it did risk getting into a co-parent agreement, which we didn't want to get into. And we'd met quite a few people who had done co-parenting and were burnt by that. Another couple, and this is something that um, Justine Woods was just speaking about earlier when she was presenting some of the legal." Um, <coughs> Another couple said that they had considered altruistic surrogacy, but neither had a sister or a female friend that they could approach. Altruistic surrogacy is not just the absence of formal payment or compensation, it's the absence of a contract. And with this comes the absence of a certainty that the child born through the arrangement will end up in the care of the intended parents. Because the laws in Australia favour the woman who gives birth to the child, even if both intended parents are the genetic parents of the child, the woman who gives birth to the child is considered the legal mother. This poses such a problem for intended parents who have already spent many years trying to have a child, whether through adoption, fostering or assisted reproductive technology, that these, adoptions, uh, these options do not seem like choices at all, but rather closed doors. So intended parents frame their decision to use surrogacy around the choices that they did not have. For example, why adoption was not an option, why fostering was not an option, uh, why they could not use an altruistic surrogate, the assisted reproductive technologies that they tried and that it failed them, their desire for a child, and then the ethical considerations. Not necessarily in that order, I've just grouped them all together. Many intended parents think that surrogacy, commercial surrogacy in India, they think about it for very many months before they decide to approach a clinic, mainly trying to work out how they feel about the process and how this fits in with their own morality. The Australian intended parents I spoke with had extensive knowledge of commercial surrogacy and had researched the ethical aspects thoroughly. One intended parent even had put together an impressive list of academic articles and books about surrogacy that rivaled my own. Ethical considerations in relation to the decision-making process at, um, as well at, at the early stages of surrogacy, surrogacy, surrogacy process. Yeah. So at the early stage of the surrogacy process, the concerns were all about the gestational surrogate from what people told me. So I'm quoting. Then we saw that there was Indian surrogacy. But initially I was turned off because of the fact that it's not a good thing to do for Indian women. I thought it was more... I was worried about exploiting Indian women and things like that. We kept looking into Indian surrogacy in lots of clinics. I wasn't comfortable with women being in large dormitories and being away from their families all the time and things like that. So this is prior to going to India while researching it online. Most intended parents expressed that they generally felt sure that their gestational carrier was treated well, so this is once they're um, with the clinic, and was well cared for but that they would have felt more comfortable and assured of the woman's well-being if they'd been allowed to view the living quarters 
and visit the woman working as their gestational carrier in her quarters, so where she was living at the time. Some intended parents expressed that they found it difficult to deal with the anonymity and the distance, both culturally and geographically, between themselves and their child's gestational carrier. I'm quoting again. It's hard to convey just how you feel when someone is doing this for you. It's so emotional, you know, on both sides. I mean, she was obviously going through huge emotional changes. And just being able to convey that to her. And you know, she's a married woman, and you have to be careful how you interact with her. So that was going a bit into the, the different cultural um, aspects. There are also mixed feelings about the general practice of not allowing the surrogates to see the babies after birth. On the one hand, I don't think all clinics do that. Though. On the one hand, IPs understand this measure as being to protect their best interests and possibly the emotional attachment, attachment to the surrogate. And I'm quoting, we saw her after he was born, uh, our baby, but, he, she, uh, but she, uh, he was never with us when we saw her. She said she'd like to see him, but we were told no. So, uh, but I know that she wanted to see our baby. <coughs> and then another quote, the surrogate didn't get to meet our child face to face. They tried to deliver our baby naturally, but they ended up having to do a cesarean. The child was taken to the antenatal unit and she didn't get to see him. Another intended parent was very keen to stay in touch with the surrogate that gave birth to his child and spoke about staying in touch with the clinic for months after his baby was born and asking him to pass on, and asking the clinic to pass on messages and gifts as well as inquiring about how she was going. I'm quoting again, I just want to know that she was uh, happy with the decision that she made and I'm always sending emails to the clinic, calling them, sending them texts. I'd like to have a chance to see her again but they say she's 12 hours away from the clinic. After just 10 to 12 days, she took the train back, which was a 12-hour journey, and she had a caesarean. The concern with the surrogate's well-being uh, carried on well after birth, uh, the birth of the child, and there's a real need to reach out and maintain that relationship. The feeling of gratitude for some intended parents, the feeling of gratitude towards the surrogate um, that is felt to be inexpressible, um, in part because of the geographical cultural and, li and linguistic distance. So I'm quoting again. I just had to believe that she, the surrogate, is now happy. She has a house now and no one can take that from her and her kids are healthy, but I would like to go back and see her. I'm always thinking about her and because I just can't convey that, I just have to accept that. Another as aspect of distance intended parents spoke about was that of the anonymity of the egg donors. None of the couples I spoke with used sperm donation, but many used an egg donor. Legislation regarding egg and sperm donation in India ensures anonymity of the donor, which contrasts with recent legislation in Australia. Where legislation in India protects the right of the donor to remain anonymous, legislation in Australia protects the right of the child to know who the genetic parents are. Intended parents' response to the fact that their children, through egg donation, will not have the option of locating their generic parent in the future, range from feeling generally uncomfortable to specific concerns. For example, and I'm quoting, we'd shipped our eggs over from uh, South Africa and we'd flown our egg donor over to the clinic in India at the same time. We weren't allowed to meet her um, because I think she didn't want contact from memory. But she was here at the same time as us, so it was strange. And then there was concern over the child's right in the future to have access to the gen their genetic heritage. And I'm quoting, we know who our child's egg donor is, we know her name, we have her bio, we know where she lives, but that's about it. But we don't know specific information, like we would over here if you have your own donor. If she moves, we won't know where she is. We hope that one day our child may be able to know who she is. We hope that things will change. The adoption and fostering programs in Australia present infertile and gay couples with the statistically low chance of success and the prospect of co-parenting with both the genetic parents and the state. With the ban on commercial surrogacy in Australia, couples have the option of trying to have a child through altruistic surrogacy arrangements. For many, this is not an option either because they do not know any women who would be willing to act as a surrogate or because there's no certainty that the surrogate would not change her mind 
and either want to retain custody of the child or enter into a co-parenting agreement. The options for Australian couples who cannot have children independently are extremely limited to the extent that couples feel their only option is to look abroad. Intended parents from Australia frame their experience of commercial surrogacy in India around all the options that do <coughs> work for them. Commercial surrogacy in India is represented um, in the way that intended parents speak about it as both the only option and the last resort in their journey to have a child. That's the end. From San Francisco, um, married to my wife, Pam, who's the actual documentary maker. I was just kind of involved in this um, because we live in the same house and I can't avoid being involved in it. <laughs> um, but uh, look, when, when Pam's, when after years of marriage and we didn't <clears throat> quite have the family we wanted in the time frame we were looking at, she says, well, you know, there's altruistic surrogacy in Australia. And I said, wait a minute, altruistic means like they do stuff for free, right? Yeah, <laughs> because all, everyone here knows the exorbitant costs associated with uh, surrogacy egg donation in the U.S. That's just half the story, because what I found out, and was most of everyone here in this room knows, is that the, the hoops, the obstacles, get almost impossible, despite it being altruistic. And so with, with our journey, we saw this as something that really had to be told. And as Pam is a filmmaker, <clears throat> she said, yeah, John, but, but honestly, uh, the topic of surrogacy and egg donation has been covered many, many times before. But we realized that it was covered from a sensationalistic angle where there's more half-truths and misinformation that do more harm than good. And so what we wanted to do was was get this information out, get it out to the people, and, and certainly not the people in this room. I, I would be preaching to the choir. Get it to the people outside of this room who don't understand what's involved, who don't see all of the archaic laws that need to be changed in the processes and procedures and so forth. Um, and we are currently in the process of creating that documentary. We're very close to getting ABC to say yes and write us a check, very close. Um, we have developed some of the material, and I'll go ahead and, and read a few of the, um, just two uh, stories that uh, we're covering. But at the end of the, um, at the end of my presentation, we'll, I'll go ahead and give you an update of where we are currently. Before I begin, I think it's important to note that what I've found out personally is that surrogacy and egg donation is the last step. That's the last stop on the train. Most people have undergone IVF um, after try, trying unsuccessfully to, uh, to have a child conceived naturally. IVF egg donation is basically it. With that, Pam and I saw a lot of emotion that you would probably not see elsewhere. Because people facing surrogacy and egg donation understand that this, if this doesn't work, that's it. That's it. So the first scenario is uh, Marie. Now, we've changed the names and locations to protect the innocent. Marie, 32, is a single mom and lives with her daughter, Sally, two and a half years old in Darwin. She's a first-time traditional surrogate, and unlike gestational surrogates who proceed through IVF and receive the genetic embryo of their intending parents, Marie conceived naturally by having sex with a partner. She and her IPs decided on this course of action because of the frustrations that expense they experienced with IVF. Both groups actually experienced a lot of grief. The partner was not one of the commissioning parents. Now, Marie had always been interested in helping people and admits to being a sucker for a hard luck story. When we discussed um, this issue with uh, um, surrogates, we found an underlying theme that was actually pretty interesting 
that existed in all surrogates and most egg donors. We'll cover that in a sec. Um, Marie is a qualified nurse, and Marie's IPs are Frank, uh, 52, and Gina, 47. Uh, Frank and Gina uh, met and married, and they also live in Darwin. So Frank has three grown kids and has had a vasectomy. He has little interest in having more children but pursued surrogacy uh, for Gina. I don't know if anyone here can relate to that story, where there's conflict within the IPs as well. Um, Gina, who was at the end of her tether after 15 years of unsuccessful pregnancy attempts, uh, was married previously and went through IVF with her last partner, who unfortunately left her in the middle of treatment. Despite their luck in finding Marie, Frank and Gina had issues which threatened to derail the entire journey. Um, both were res uh, recovering from terrible divorces and their finances were absolute shambles. Uh, they were unemployed and struggling to make ends meet. Gina complained that Frank didn't, hadn't done enough to secure a well-paying job and was drinking heavily, while Frank was quick to point out that most of their money was spent pursuing a pie-in-the-sky dream of having kids. That's not a good scenario, but that exists. Marie was filled with questions. She became unsure if she would feel a strong bond with her child. Now remember, this is her natural kid and would want to part with it. Uh, this was due to her discovery that Gina had concealed a serious medical condition from her, violating, violating Marie's trust. She had also expressed concern over Gina's waning interest in the pregnancy. Neither Gina nor Frank had visited her in the past six months, despite living only half an hour's drive away. Hmm. Her questions were many. Could Frank and Gina afford a new baby? Was Gina uh, at a shock, or was she shocked at being so close to achieving a baby dream? That is also a situation most people don't address. You've wanted this bloody thing so much, well, here it is. What do I do with it? Very few people think about that. Or was she having second thoughts at having to take care of a baby at the ripe old age of 50? In consequence, Marie sought counseling, and she and the counselor agreed that it was not a good idea to proceed with the existing intending parents. The child was ultimately adopted out to a couple at birth who were better prepared psychologically for the commitment. The second scenario involves uh, Karen, who lives in Melbourne with her husband and their three, uh, excuse me, four kids. Uh, she's a stay-at-home mom and also schools the kids uh, at home. Um, she volunteered to be an IP for Sue and Andrew, Sue's 41, Andrew's 38, as a this gestational surrogate. Sue and Andrew are actually medical professionals. Um, they use Andrew's sperm with the egg of an overseas donor. Now, neither Andrew nor Sue who was open to discussing much about their surrogacy journey. This is also another issue we found. In fact, we found that the surrogates and the egg donors were more willing to tell their stories than the IPs. And I would have thought that it would be a more compelling story to tell the IPs who are motivated to get this thing done than the surrogates, but it's, it's a tougher sell. Andrew and Sue were concerned about what their friends and colleagues would think or would say given their social status. Um, they also had a long string of failures that they didn't want to talk about, uh, failures which included 15 years of trying to start a family um, unsuccessful. And they also lost eight pregnancies, one with twins. The longest pregnancy lasted only 16 weeks. To date, as medical professionals, they still don't know why they're infertile. Like Marie, Karen had a difficult time saying no to helping others, but it was a tragic event during her teens which may better explain uh, Marie's motiva uh, Karen's motivation to be a surrogate. Um, 
Whilst working as a lifesaver at a local swimming pool, she didn't notice that a teenage boy, this is a surrogate as a, as a young woman, that a teenage boy who had, uh, had slipped and fallen into the deep end of the pool. Minutes passed before she and another lifesaver realized what had happened, although she responded quickly, the boy eventually died. Um, she denies this, but Pam and I figure that this event triggered her wanting to make up for it through surrogacy and egg donation. So far, the journey for Karen and her IPs uh, have been exhausting. The law of the state where they're proceeding requires several psychological and physical assessments to be completed prior to entering a surrogacy arrangement. Only now, more than 12 months after starting their journey, have Karen and her IP been given, given the go ahead by the government. The egg donor has recently undergone two IVF cycles in order to obtain her eggs, but they were canceled due to lack of response to drugs. So this, this scenario is, is still undergoing, and we're hoping that it leads to a positive result. The, the idea, the impetus behind the documentary is that most of the people outside of this room, most of the people outside of organizations such as this, have very little, if any, idea of what's involved in surrogacy and egg donation. We want to change that. We want to put out there the real stories, the, the good, the bad, the ugly, and show people this is the reality. If you are fortunate enough to be young, healthy, and able to conceive naturally, amen, hallelujah. But God help you if you can't, because you have to undergo psychological, sometimes criminal exams to make sure that you will be fit to be a parent. It's unfair, it's asinine, it's reality. And what we would like to do is paint a truthful picture with this documentary with the support of people like yourselves and get the truth out there to the world. And that's the only way any meaningful change will occur. We're, like I said, very close to uh, having ABC green light the project. Um, because surrogacy and egg donation, it just happens, they don't stop, they don't cut. You know, when we say cut, they just kind of keep going, babies get born. We would welcome the participation of others, either a surrogate, uh, a donor, or, or intending parents, who want to participate with this documentary. Um, Pam and I will be available at, uh, at lunch, milling around. Um, we would love to talk to you, see if perhaps we can find a fit, and, uh, and include you in this very important work. Any questions? You guys are really hungry. You can tell the glaze, though. Thank you very much.